Huge have he does have his challenger ring on. Does he have the Temerian ring on? I can't see it. Maybe he doesn't want to intimidate his opponent too much. Maybe it's enough with his presence. He'll keep the ring, you know, in his room, locked away, in case, you know, some some sneaky thieves are roaming the castle. Well, yeah, after all, he's not interested in wearing that one this weekend, right? He's all about this, the Ring of the Great Sun. But finally, we are heading into our first game, and it looks like we're going to be heading into a Skelliger versus Skelliger showdown. And today seems to be the day of the mirrors. We've seen a lot of them already. <laughs> yes. And yet one more for the count. We see a Skelliger King Brand Mirror coming right away. And uh, there are some differences, but I think not too many in general. Uh, there's actually a couple of really... There's actually a couple... There we go. There's actually a couple of really interesting differences uh, between the two decks here, primarily in the choice of gold cards. Now, we see Game King running an almost, dare I say, old school lineup of golds. He's got Igni, Coral, Madman Lugos, and Surus. Whereas Life Coach is running a more modern variant where he has omitted Lugos and Igni and he is running Muzzle and Wolfsbane instead. Yeah, Igni is a big staple in most of Game King's decks. I think he really likes the card and he likes, you know, getting that. Because it has kind of a very high value ceiling in, in general. And if you find the right uh, points to, to play that card out in, in a certain round, you can get a lot of value from it. And I think Game King really values that. Um, the fact that it's not really capped at a certain uh, point gap really. And it's just a very high ceiling card in general. Yeah, definitely. I must admit that I'm a big fan of it in this deck because of the Whale Harpooners and just the potential that they open up for just lining up some crazy Ignis. I know it's kind of, you know, the pipe dream Igni, but every now and again you hit it and it's very, very satisfying. And especially with Hensel in the meta, for example, which is a deck that, although it's been banned by Game King, um, it's one of the decks and a few others that have all these units that you want to line up in one row and they have the same strength, and if people aren't playing around Igni, it gets really dangerous really quickly. Yeah, definitely. Now, those Armorsmiths may, you know, they may actually come in pretty big if those Whale Harpoon just start swinging. Life Coach is going to be very, very happy that he has that Armorsmith in his hand. Armorsmith, the card that we've even seen, put to great use so far this tournament. And Game King having two of them, not just the standard one in this list, he's changed the list just a little bit, maybe teched uh, towards what decks he thinks um, his opponents would be bringing to this tournament. Um, and we see a pretty standard opening from Life Coach, Ceres, Olgerd, and Wolfsbane to the graveyard, banished and ready to go. Um, um, of course, Ceres, it's a card that kind of defines this, this archetype a bit. Oh, absolutely. Surus with her Resurrection Time. If you don't know Surus, when you play her into the graveyard, she then gets a four-turn timer, and that ticks down by one every time you resurrect a unit. Now, that counts things such as discarding raiders, because they immediately resurrect once discarded. And when that timer hits zero, Surus jumps out of the graveyard back onto the battlefield and so helps you really table. just gain tempo. And you're absolutely right, it's sort of become the signature of Skelliger recently. And here we see uh, Game King focusing on the same gold card, Ceres, Morkvark, and potentially a Raider going to be going out to uh, the graveyard and obviously going to resurrect um, very quickly. I definitely don't think he's going to discard a Lugos. That wouldn't be a great idea. Uh, we do see the Raider coming out. Just a, you know, a little bit of tempo from Game King trying to stay ahead of Life Coach here. Yeah, absolutely. Mind game's good. Discarding a Lugos on your first turn is not. So we see Game King absolutely going for the standard opening. Now, this is where the variance becomes quite interesting. Because Life Coach is running this Wolfsbane, he has to get that into the graveyard, which automatically lowers the tempo from this brand opening a little bit. So Game King, despite also using his King brand, is now 10 points ahead. And Game King does have the Olgur in hand, something you normally want to have in the graveyard and leave those raiders for the Warmonger synergy. Instead, he ended up with the Olgur in hand and he has to play it for just nine points for the silver, which does have the carryover value that helps with the, with the Ceres value and also just carry over the next few rounds. So it's not too bad, but it's not a great uh, tempo play in round one. Yeah, I really love Life Coach's thinking behind it, including Olgur over Morkvark. Now, this is quite an unusual choice. And I believe the reason for it is that he wants to guarantee that Ceres gets uh, tick downs on her timer at the beginning of rounds because Morkvark. Just We've seen earlier, here. right? You play against Erodin, Frost kills your Morkvag a bunch of times, Cyrus comes out round one, you don't get that Cyrus necessarily in round two or three. Whereas Olgiad sitting safely in the graveyard, it just means that either, you know, unless they want to do a very low value like Katakan or Caretaker, that Olgiad is going to come out at the beginning of the next round and give you valuable times on that Cyrus counter. I think also running Wolfsbane kind of indicates that maybe you're not too worried about tempo at the, at the start of round one, where Morkvag normally helps a lot. Because you have those two, 12 points coming in, uh, a, bit, a little bit later at three th three rounds in, but it's still a decent amount of tempo that helps you survive and kind of push that round one out. Absolutely, but that, <laughs> that Wolfsbane bomb is ticking down in Life Coach's graveyard. Game King's got one more turn until it goes off. Do you think Game King is really going to push against this Wolfsbane, or do you think he's just going to be fairly happy to leave it at that? I mean, Wolfsbane does damage, and Armorsmith's heal damage, so Game King has the right answer in his hand to get, you know, a fairly, fairly valuable uh, bronze uh, Armorsmith there, but, you know, decent amount of points. Um, it also counters that Wolfsbane a little bit, so it maybe not right now immediately, but further into this round, if Harpooners are dropped and some more damage is done, he can definitely go for that Armorsmith to get a really good bronze value card. Yeah, definitely. I really like the point 
point there of uh, Armorsmith somewhat negating the Wolfsbane, actually. You know, Wolfsbane hits for 12 because of the 6 buff and the 6 damage. Armorsmith would actually be a 13 just by repairing that damage. So, yeah, really, really beautiful counter card there when you see the Armorsmith compared to the Wolfsbane. A bronze really taking down a gold. And Genking with three Harpooners in his hand, maybe a bit too much. You do want to wait a bit till the board develops to play these cards where they get maximum value. With you know, once more units are played, more rows are stacked, and the Harpooners get you know more value in general. So further into the round, they're better. Having three in hand right off the bat, maybe it's it's it, you know it, it makes your hand a bit awkward at the very start. Yeah, expect to see both players stacking rows very very carefully here because these are the best players in the world. They know whale Harpooners exist. And they're going to play around them accordingly. They are fully aware that Whale Harpooners will play a very large part in this mirror. And there we see the Wolfsbane doing its magic, uh, buffing King Brand up to 8 and hitting that Olgear for 6 points. Olgear already lost his head. I don't think he minds the, the 6 points too much. And we have the Armistice to help him out as well, uh, get back his strength. And of course, we see Game King. He discarded a Battle Maiden, which you know kind of says he might just go for the early restore to have that Battle Maiden uh, for multiple rounds, not just that round 3 finish with the restore, and also get the extra Warmonger out to thin out the Raiders. Yeah, it's really interesting how this match is going to progress from here on out because it's all about resource committal, right? It's about how comfortable these guys are with committing significant resources in this opening round. We could end up seeing, you know, Game King pass on the next turn, or it could go to being one of those really deep, let's go into round two with two cards each, just fist fights. It's going to be interesting to see how each player chooses to proceed. And the important part is the carryover. Game King has both Olgard and Morgfarg, as well as Ceres, of course. And Life Coach only has the Morgfarg, or only has the Olgard. He does not have the Morgfarg, but, I mean, never mind. We see, obviously, Olgard switch sides. Not a very, uh, you know, not, not helping Game King out too much there. The muzzle being very effective for Life Coach. Yeah, absolutely. And Life Coach really showing his preference for Olgard over Morgfarg there, because he actually prioritized taking that, despite the fact it was a minus four compared to muzzling the Morgfarg, because he just prefers Olgard as a card. He wants those beginning of round resurrects, and that beginning of round Cyrus to come out. And so he took the Olgeard over the Morgfog. And of course, although he maybe loves Olgeard, having the arms within hand to, to buff up that Olgeard and denying it from Game King as well, kind of swings that and makes that card. Uh, right now, the muzzle wasn't as effective, but you know, if you think a little bit further in, it's going to be very effective where you can heal that up and, and deny the heal from your opponent as well. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, at the point in this matchup, you know, you're really using those armor smiths just to repair very goddess. simple damage. Things like well up in There's not going to be any weather attrition unless a player chooses to spend their Gremist in such a way. So the, the armor smiths, you can, to be honest, in this matchup, I always think if you can find like 11 or 12 plus points of value from the armor smith, you're going to be pretty happy. And we see Game King here not discarding the Raider. I think he's saving them for round three as a burst option with a Freya res. Of course, in this deck, you don't really have, you know, for example, the Raging Bears that are a 12 point, you know, card to res in round three. You want something that can generate points, not only points, but also rest takes on the Ceres. And he decides to save those Raiders for round three and have that, that pool that he can draw into with the Warmongers to create not only tempo, but also Ceres takes uh, just to have a really good finisher in round three. Yeah, definitely. This is getting to the point in the game where, honestly, Game King is going to have to start dropping Harpooners just to deal tempo, right? He's not really going to have any other options available to him. So this could quickly descend into a long round one. And this is a tie that Life Coach might think about taking. Uh, right now, he does have more carryover, I believe, um, regardless of the Ceres, because he had he stole that Olgard. Not only does he get more carryover, but he steals carryover from his opponent, which is huge. And he's given this this majestical pass, having lost the coin flip, which he's definitely going to take. He's a player that really values card advantage, and he thinks this is definitely his chance to take it. Yeah, definitely. And at the beginning of round two, that Ceres is on a two time, but he has two Olgards. So Olgard will, will double jump out of the graveyard and bring Ceres along with him. So yeah, Life Coach and that muzzle for the carryover, really, really great here. And now this is a game of Oodlerix. If Game King is able to draw that Oodlerix, he won't be too worried. If Life Coach draws it back, then he can answer back with that. So it's going to be important to see what these players mold and how they draw in this round, too. There we go. That is 16 points worth of carryover. Lugos, a very nice draw for Game King, but not his spy. And that Raider is going to get Mulligan straight away. Will Game King find the Oodlerix here? He does. He, he does! does find oh it. my goodness, what a mulligan by Game King. Game King believing in the heart of the cards, not <laughs> not getting rid of that raid around one. He knows he's going to draw it and he's going to mulligan it, sacrifice it exactly. to the Skelter Gods, and then draw the Ulrich to try and save this game and get that card advantage back in round two. Exactly. Game King's deck doesn't have any bad cards, and he drew his Ulrich just as he wanted. And that but is going to be key, but Life Coach has got his too. He, just, he doesn't only have Ulrich, he has Ulrich and Summoning Circle. Oh, he can really God. turn this game around and really punish Game King here. Game King's going to have to out-tempo Life Coach in this round in a mirror that's very complicated. I mean, you guys... 
they basically play the same cards, so it's very hard to pull ahead, especially with, you know, already being so many points behind. Yeah, I mean, one of the advantages he has is Lugos is really nice in the mirror, because Coral kind of lacks big targets. I mean, sure, you can hit it on, you know, maybe like a 12-strength bear or something, or your own Ulderic, but uh, that's like a it's like a 15-point Coral. That's pretty much the upper limit of what you're going to see, unless you're against, like, Cursed, where, you know, they're playing these huge Berserk Marauders or Great Swords. Unlike that, Harpooner Skelliger doesn't have great targets for Coral, so I would value Lugos slightly higher here. And of course, Game King, because of the Raider Mulligan and the, and the you know, fact that he was forced to Mulligan that, he wasn't able to Mulligan Harpooner, and that blocks the, the Battle Maiden from getting res in this turn as well, because there aren't really any targets, um, unless there is one single Warmonger left, which I believe there is. Um, but he really, Game King really wants to you know, get the maximum value from that Restore on the Battle Maiden. If he reses it once in a game, it's, it's good, but it's not fantastic. If he can res it multiple times and get that eight points of, of value every time for that buffed up Battle Maiden, then he's going to be really happy. Absolutely. And Life Coach, recognizing the opportunities he has here, employ the now infamous tunnel vision and there comes the Ulderic. He is here. And then we're gonna see summoning circle maybe soon as well so he has the option. He gets the raider discard as well which is huge in terms of points. It makes Ulderic only eight points so uh, these these spies that synergize with the archetype is, is fantastic. The fact they can synergize with, with discard and, and obviously board. discard that raider, in here. thin your deck, get rid of a card you don't really want in your deck all the time and uh, get you know some more tempo because of that. Yeah absolutely that was a perfect draw for life coach there. Nice harpooner that's a high tempo card and then the Raider to go on the discard to perfect synergy with Ulderic. Like you say, lowering the cost to a mere eight points, which is very good. The sort of stuff you normally see in Nilfgaard from Rainfarn and whatnot. So both players honestly looking at <laughs> remarkably similar hands right now. So who do you, do you just have to give the edge to the card advantage here? I mean, we see similar hands, but we see a fairly big point gap on the board. So you start to get worried for Game King. Is he, able to, is he going to be able to pull back uh, this card advantage and go into round three on even cards? If he isn't, we've seen it before in other matchups. If you go a card down into round three, like we saw with Kolomon and Azikov, it can sometimes be, you know, game breaking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one advantage that Game King does have is his Cyrus is on a one-timer, so should he choose to, he can catch up relatively quickly, because that Cyrus, of course, will add seven points to anything that he resurrects. So he does have that option available to him, but that would then set his Cyrus to a four-timer for round three, and that is not something you want when Life Coach has double all geared carryover. And already he's two cards down and still six points behind. I mean, it's not looking good for Game King. I think maybe that the fact that he tied in round one and he couldn't, you know, maybe discard that Raider and, and you know, take the lead in that round one uh, cost him a lot considering he did not have more carryover than, than his opponent. Uh, it, it put him in a really tough situation. I think he's going to have a really hard time going into round three uh, being on even cards. Yeah, it's certainly a little bit of a rough position. You've got to like Life Coach's position right now. That point gap was closed a little bit, but it's still on six points. But Game King does have the first round, so of course he is still dictating the flow of the game. So it's everyone's to play for, but honestly, Life Coach getting that Ulderic was big for him. If we talk about finishers, I think uh, Game King does have a bit of an edge here, like you said, with Ceres, and also the fact he can discard. I think he has more raiders in his graveyard yeah, than uh, his opponent, so he has a chance to get the, you know, the multiple Warmonger reses into the raiders and, and get the extra tempo and the extra Ceres ticks as well. Um, and of course, the restore target with the Battle Maiden is also a great uh, card to have as a finisher for round three, but I mean, just the card advantage, it's so, so huge going into round three. It's just a, it's a vital part of Gwent. Absolutely, especially in a mirror match, right? It's like, you got to be blunt and be like, okay, they're playing pretty similar decks. Therefore, the person who has more of one deck than the other is probably going to do better. And that essentially is card advantage. But I like that Life Coach recognizes the max value Coral available to him and decides to take it. So he doesn't have to take up a lesser opportunity later in the game. Important to note as well, Game King, he can row stack here and kind of dodge the Harpooner damage. But Life Coach, he's playing a version of this deck that does run the last rate and does have that punish patient. to either play around Harpooner or no play, around, play around last rate. You can play around both. And if he decides to play around that last rate, um, the Harpoons are going to get value because of the way around. It's, it's you know vice versa, so it's a tough situation. Yeah, definitely. Game King discarding a Freya there, interestingly, presumably to res chain them out, or even for his restore as a target. But restore is actually potentially unavailable, so. I think that it's interesting that he might just res chain just to get Saris out because he's I think, really desperate for tempo. I think he has the chances to, to get the, the reses in round three to get Saris out again. But even then, I mean, if he can't catch up in card advantage, like we've said multiple times before, we're kind of overstating it, but it's, just, it's so important <laughs> it's so and key, so vital yeah. that you really have to. Um, I think the round one really decided the game that the fact that the Game King was able to tie there may be a miscalculation, but the 33 point tie there uh, was huge in life coach. Uh, he thought about it for a bit. He is a, the guy that likes taking his time and think about his plays, but I think it was fairly straightforward for him to pass at that moment. Yeah, honestly, it was a very critical pass. and. 
That's an interesting question. I actually wonder, I'm interested in what Swim makes of it later, whether he thinks that Game King deliberately forced the tie, or whether he thinks that it was a miscalculation, because it's very interesting to give Life Coach that opportunity. It was the perfect spot for him to get back card advantage. Of course, if your opponent doesn't play Ulrich, it's fine, but Life Coach is playing both Ulrich and Summoning Circle, so it wasn't going to get by him. He's ready for the situation. He knows what could happen in this matchup, in this mirror matchup, for example, and he was ready for it. Where do you think we see the... Where do you think we see the Summoning Circle going from here? I mean, I think it might just get value from a Harpooner, for example, which is going to get decent value, I think, especially in the long round. Uh, maybe also an Armorsmith, depending on the situation. Uh, of course, Nidrifa, uh, you can't really copy that. It'll, it'll copy whatever is uh, placed on the board. So, in general, it will get normally just bronze value, I think. Yeah, definitely. I certainly hope so. Like, at least, you know, we say typically bronze value, but that could be a bronze value on a Harpooner or an Armorsmith, <laughs> which are pretty good. So, I think the Summoning Circle is still going to be a pretty nice card here. We're going to see Whale Harpooners start to do a little bit of damage. They can still ping that Alderic for a fair bit too. But Game King is running out of cards that he wants to spend realistically. I mean, I think he has to spend everything. He has to do everything possible to try and catch up here. But unless Life Coach has dead cards in hand, he's not going to really do so. So it's tough, I think. Uh, game Life Coach obviously looking at his options. Harpooners are still quite decent for him. He does have that, that value on that on that Warmonger. Although, of course, it won't die and, and it'll just just pass on the, the value to the armor smith so not ideal but still decent to just you know keep on playing cards and, and keep on you know being ahead in this matchup yeah definitely i'm interested when we see the lugos come out i imagine he wants to keep that for round three but it's going to be rough for game king like you say he's got to just try to catch up but in terms of big tempo plays he is sorely lacking right now that we'll have to see what targets play? lugos has as well because Trinity? there aren't that many big bronzes left in, in game king's deck i think uh he was running two armor smith we've seen one played already and we have a second one here and then the three harpooners we've seen as well so unless he has a warmonger safe for that lugos which he might want to use the battle minion on for example i mean it, it's tough to say yeah it could just be coming out for 14 with the raider that might that might be an option as well um with the Saris in round three as well it's decent but not you know i think lugos is better used as a, as a damage and then yep. have the warmonger because obviously warmongers don't have the option to damage so it kind of frees up two two ways to, to play the warmonger and the lugos out differently but game king might be forced to play it with the raider there here comes sig drifter let's see what she's going to go for the resurrect on what do you need if it's just going to be Grammys. I mean, you can't do the battle lane because yeah. there just aren't targets, I think, uh, if you're thinking about Lugos as well in round three. Ooh, eating the Cyrus too. Interesting, considering it doesn't give him the pass. It gives him the chance to, to play more reses in this round while still getting the ticks on Cyrus, so it kind of frees him to really play into this round a lot and try and find maybe a dead card from Life Coach at the very end to try and get that card advantage back, but it's maybe just too late. I mean, the fact that it was three strength helped. It's not a seven strength Cyrus, so you still get a decent amount of tempo, but even then, he's just still a point behind being two cards down. It's never a good situation to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Especially considering that we're talking about, you know, he's sort of fishing for a dead coach. Uh, sorry, dead, a dead coach. Well, you know, that, that, that would win in the series, but a dead card from Life Coach here, and he's not going to find one. Life Coach's hand is looking pretty good. And even if Harpooner gets a lot of value, the Armorsmith counters it in the mirror matchup. It works quite well. Other matchups, not so much, but because Harpooner does so much damage, uh, and it's not just uh, the eight strength that it has on its, on its card, but also the deployability it does a lot of damage, unlike other cards that do, you know, a tiny bit of damage like Wyvern, for example, but yeah, not just, so much. Just compare the boards here, it's interesting because while uh, Life Coach can do. You know, he can hit the large targets. Those are able to be healed by an Armorsmith. What you can do in this matchup is just kill targets. You can just kill three strengths, as long as you don't think they got the Resurrect. Like if Sigdrif has come out, etc. You can kill lower strength targets just to guarantee the Armorsmith can't heal them up. But in this case, Game King's actually going to get a pretty okay Armorsmith out of this. Exactly. You lose one or two points sometimes, but it's kind of the risk you take. And if you really expect your opponent to have Armorsmith, which isn't crazy in the mirror, I mean, it's a card that's won at least one of it in pretty much every deck. Yeah. Uh, so I think it, it's, it's correct to do that sometimes, but other times you have to risk it and just try and get maximum points and hope he doesn't have Armorsmith. Yeah, and that's what Life Coach is really trying to do. He's just trying to open up that points gap as much as possible. So it looks like we may just see Lugos come down. Oh. Armorsmith right, a bit early and might have to wait because there are still Harpooners in Life Coach's deck. We've only Great seen two, so he knows there's at least one more. Um, but of course, Game King going for the early uh, Armorsmith there and might, you know, punish him in the next few turns. It certainly might. I mean, we might see a lot more damage coming out of Life Coach here, especially if he chooses to employ that other Armorsmith. And that is really just denying himself future value by playing that Armorsmith so early for Game King. So, yeah, that might come back to bite him. And because a Game King has Ceres in his graveyard, he is able to play his res and play pretty much all his cards in this round, where a Life Coach has his Ceres on his board, so it's not getting those ticks going. But he has two old Guards to, to help with that in round three, so I mean, I don't think he's too worried, to be honest. No, I don't think he is either. Considering the strength of his hand, I think he's in a pretty, 
pretty comfortable position. Of course, he does not know the contents of Game King's hand, but if he did, he'd probably be smiling. Yeah, I think he's pretty happy regardless. Um, Summoning Circle might be used now. It's a card that you can't guarantee value because it's a card that kind of depends on your opponent's cards. So he wants to get rid of that kind of maybe luck or RNG that he's going to have in round three and just have the cards he really wants to have in round three and, and not leave it up to his opponent's decisions, basically. Oops, our first one second life coach turn. There we go. He is, of course, known to take his time and certainly think about his plays like we see there. Going for the Summoning Circle. So like you say, just guarantee that value and getting 11 points out of it. Not too bad. Yeah, it's not too bad at all. I mean, it's pretty much the, the standard silver value. Uh, normally, when you use summoning circle in different situations where it, it can really excel, other times it's going to be you know pretty average. But uh, life coach decided to bring it to the tournament, and we'll see why throughout this weekend. But I think he definitely has you know the maybe some great great ideas behind that card. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure that we'll see it used to great effect should he move on in the tournament, but it is very early in the series to be speculating such things. We are still nil-nil. Remember, this is a best of five for the final spot in tomorrow's semifinals, which is very, very exciting. Going to be taking on Freddy Babes, the winner of this game. And it's very important to note as well, Life Coach did lose the coin flip in this match, and still he has the upper edge. So yes. that's not only worrying for Game King for this, for this certain you know match right now, but for the matchup in general. Yeah, it's a really critical win. If you win, to be blunt, if you win when you're in blue coin, that's how you win the series. If you win your first game when you're in blue coin, and you then get to go second straight after, you're going to be happy about that. That's such a powerful start to a series. So the, both of these players are good to win from the blue, of course, but this is a very, very powerful start for Life Coach so far. Yeah, and we see Armorsmith again getting some decent value. Not great in a short round too, because you can't really, uh, like I said get before, depend on your opponent to do damage to get to get that value from the Armorsmith. Instead, he uses it this turn and just tries to, to guarantee the value in this round and, and save his better cards like Drifa or Freya for the round three. Yeah, and here we see Life Coach just opening up that points gap to 12. Lugos has to be committed. Here. He's got to hope Life Coach has dead cards, and he's got to hope he just starts Freya's spending. But bravest. finally, right now, after multiple multiple turns, Game King is finally able to get ahead by just two points. But still, he's two cards down. I mean, it doesn't really mean too much. I think Life Coach is still in a pretty good position to to really close out the round three. Yeah, considering Life Coach's hand. Game King has set himself into a horrendous position in this game, despite the fact that he's actually playing fine for the situation here. He had to go for this after that round one, but I think the round one pass from Life Coach is really going to end up being the critical moment of this game. Not just the pass from Life Coach, but the, maybe the blunder from Game King. I think that the fact that yeah. he, he, he got that tie instead of. He had the options to go ahead, I think, for sure, um, by discarding the Raider, for example. So. It's tough to say. Uh, I mean, obviously, Game King is a very hard matchup to call. A mirror match is always complicated, but having won the coin flip, I think he could have done round one. He could have played round one a bit better to, to guarantee um, the fact that he could have, you know, kind of got an advantage from the red coin. But instead, Life Coach, uh, really, like you said, a really good pass, and it was kind of forced Game King's hand. Yeah, like you say, though, we, we've, we've spoken about this before, right? If you're going second, i.e. if you win the coin flip, ironically, um, you, can, you can afford lower tempo plays. You just can, because you have that card space to catch up, and we see this with Origin all the time, playing just four strength hounds, but, or like even just White Frost, but just setting up that longer game plan. So I f perhaps Game King didn't utilize that too much. I mean, I think it's fine, the fact that you go second, you can you can, you can, really play your low tempo plays, but the, the problem here was the carryover. He had less than life, and that was really the decider in round two that he couldn't get the dry pass, for example. Yeah, absolutely, especially with that Cyrus coming out. Starting with 16 points on the board is just so powerful, and when Game King's trying to bleed from there, it makes it really difficult. And finally, we move on to get to a round three Game King, a card behind. He might get a Cyrus out, and Life Coach might not, but even then, I mean, there's more carryover from Life Coach as well, and just having an extra card into just short round, having literally 33% more points on average. It's going to be tough to, to make it here. And Igni, not a great draw in round three. Um, there might be a mulligan here from Game King and a Raider. Oh my goodness, I'm afraid that while it is always early to call, <laughs> just judging by these hands, Game King is not going to be having a very good time right now. It looks like this first game may well be going to Life Coach. He has one card up, one Resurrect up. It is a Sigdriffer, and Game King has a Raider in hand. So while, you know, it is a dangerous game when casting to call games prematurely, I think Life Coach might win this one. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm not a betting man. Or otherwise, I would bet quite a bit of money here because I think just have, being a card up is already game deciding and game can have a sliver, slither of hope if he would have drawn a decent card, you know, a card that generates a decent amount of points, hoping that Life Coach's cards are dead and that maybe, you know, having 
some kind of an advantage there, but with the Raider in hand, it, it's the game is, I think, sealed, uh, and there's really not much to do. I mean, four points from hand, we not fantastic. Who is no, it's certainly not. Raider Kong. is not a card that you want to be playing from hand. It is a card that you want to be playing when you discard it from your deck instead. So having that in hand is pretty horrendous, and like you say, in a mirror where a single card advantage can be so game-deciding, this is just a death sentence for Game King. Although, of course, the Raider is not worth just four points, but instead it's worth 11 points Soldier because you are resing the stairs if you... You know, there's a bit of a mechanic in Gwent where yeah. you can discard from hand and the Raider uh, activates that res effect with the stairs, so it, it'll get the stairs out. You have the Freya and the Raider, it's two ticks. Um, but even then, I think it just won't be enough, especially with such a great hand from Life Coach as well. You certainly can by intelligently using the game's inbuilt discard mechanics by roping the turn. That is very true, actually. Very astute of you, but... This, it's not going to be enough. It would be a very nice little move, but I just don't think it's going to be enough. Yeah, it's a subtle thing that, you know, the subtle details sometimes decide games. In this case, not the case. I think the, the bigger details are going to decide this one, uh, especially the carryover and the card advantage. But uh, it's a thing that, you know, some players forget. And, you know, obviously these are great players. They know every little thing that happens in this game. They know all about all the little secrets. Uh, they're very sneaky players. But in this case, we the Game King being sneaky won't be enough for him. And Absolutely not. Here we see the Priestess of Freya chain, which will get out the Surus when this Whale Harpooner is res, so no sneaky discard needed. And we see the Harpooner come down onto the armor smith there, giving Game King the lead by a whopping eight points. But I'm afraid with the four from hand and a Priestess of Freya and a Sugdriffer available for Life Coach, it is not going to be enough, enough, and Life Coach is going to take this first game. And taking the first game, having lost a coin flip, is, you know, huge for Life Coach. I think he's going to have, you know, a lot of hype going into the next game. He's going to be really excited, really uh, ready to go, because if he wins that next game, already a 2-0 lead um, with his God. mental fortitude and maybe Not Game King gets a bit nervous, because, I mean, you're 2-0 down, you have to reverse sweep the last challenger champion, I mean, it's going to be yeah. tough for him mentally as well. It's very, very rough. Game King really has to keep his composure here, and the reason I say that is because the first game of the series is the game that you're mentally prepared the most for, because, you know, the players found out what coin they were, etc. yesterday, and they were like, okay, Game King will have been like, okay, great, I'm starting second. I'm going to start with my brand deck. I'm super confident on that. I can start out 1-0 up. I've got the red coin. Brilliant. And then things go wrong. And all of a sudden, you have to be able to deal with that. You've just got to be able to mentally go, okay, things didn't go as I had planned, and I've got to readjust. Whether he keeps going on to Bran, I think that we tend to see Game King change quite a lot when he loses on the leader, so I wouldn't be surprised to see him swap. So it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see how he proceeds within this series, because he's really just got to just gather himself up, wipe the slate clean, and just play for... Yeah, and just... Play to get back into it, essentially. You have to really adapt to the situation as well. I mean, considering that uh, you're going down already in the in the first matchup, you have to end with Redcoin, like you said. I mean, it's huge mentally to, to lose that game yeah. where you think you have the great advantage. You're playing maybe a deck you're very comfortable with to, to start off the matchup, and you lose. It's like, oh my god, I have to really start changing my game plan and start playing very seriously because any little mistake can cost me not only the game, but maybe the whole match and the whole tournament. So it, it's tough for game for sure. Yeah, really difficult losing that match when you're so prepared for it. You know, these players have been hyping themselves up and preparing for a while, and he knew he was going first. He's been planning to use that deck, and losing with it will be a crushing blow. But he is far from out of this yet. That is simply 1-0 to Life Coach. Both stellar players, still everything to play for. And, of course, there are many more games to come in this series. And it's going to be interesting to see what the players lead off with next. If you're Life Coach, you've chalked up your Skelliger win. So what do you lead with now you're going second? Do you just roll the spies? You have Elder Consume and you have spies left. Two very strong decks, especially if you don't have, you know, direct counters for Elder Consume. If uncountered, it can get very messy very quick. Uh, the carryover is, you know, exponential with the Neckers. They start growing and growing. No one knows how that happens, but some kind of, you know, base infestation from the Neckers. Um, and there's just... A, even it, you can't even count them. I mean, there's just too much if you don't stop that early. Although Game King has the option to maybe with with Coral, for example, to, to shut that down with Skellige. So he had, definitely has options in his decks to, to play around that. But there are two very scary leaders, I think, Amir and, and Unseen Elder. All right, I believe if I if my eyes did not deceive me, we're going to see Game King playing his Aridin. It looked like he was about to click on it. Of course, I'm now going to be entirely wrong, but it did look as if he was clicking on his Aridin there. And I love Game King because he's such a wonderfully emotive player. You can see him in between games, scratching his head, looking puzzled, wondering where it all went wrong. But that's the great thing about Game King. That doesn't upset him. It just interests him. He's legitimately just going to be searching for a way to correct what went wrong. And that is one of the things that makes him such a fantastic player. He's a very positive player, and that not only affects, you know, his outlook on life, but also the fact that he can, you know, come back in after a loss and say, you know, it doesn't matter too much. And we're going to see Game King bringing the full test, I believe it is. It is oh, the full test. You baited me. 
a very standard value filter we've seen before, also 27 cards and also including a first light to counter weather and life codes coming in with the greedy consume, uh, Necker Warriors, Neckers, Vran Warriors, I mean, it's a scary thing to see. Yeah, this is a really greedy consumer list and looking at Game King's fall test, he doesn't necessarily have too much to deal with it. He has a lacerate, uh, sorry, not a lacerate, he has a muzzle at his disposal. And he's got a margarita as well. I'm afraid I don't see that as enthusiastically as Mega Mogwai, but he has a margarita at his disposal. What do you think of this matchup? This looks to me to lean a little bit towards Greedy. Uh, I mean, Foltis doesn't have, you know, options like Coral to completely check on the Neckers. And I mean, normally in this kind of consume, you want your Neckers out as soon as possible to copy them early before the consume start triggering so that every single Necker copied gets, you know, a maximum amount of, of ticks in the graveyard and can really start growing to have not just, you know, a few strong Neckers in round three, but every single Necker buffed up and ready to go. Absolutely. Uh, and if, but if you play it soon, then you're, you're, you're weak to muzzle. So it, it's a tough call. Of course, we see Life Coach with Two uh, yeah, I was just going to hit on this. This is such a key draw that he just got in that mulligan because all of a sudden that muzzle just doesn't matter. We see two Neckers and the Shadow just in case because we've seen <laughs> situations in other tournaments in the past Gwen Slam where the Neckers are, are a sneaky bunch. They like to hide away in the deck and not come out uh, in round one. But here they definitely come out in force and I think Life Coach is not going to be too worried about that. Definitely has the targets for the Necker Warriors and really the base of his game plan. Yeah, for sure. I find it so interesting that he hit that double Necker draw because that turns Muzzle from For this winning the game to six points. Because it just makes no difference, because as soon as you hit the Necker Warrior on that Necker, it's like, sure, you've lost one, but you still have the core of your deck remaining. So such a fortunate mulligan to be fair for Life Coach there. And we also see a great trio of cards. We see the Harpy, the Vran, and the Slizzard that work great in conjunction, because of course the, the Vran can eat the Harpy, um, and then the Slizzard can bring out another Harpy and just feed those eggs, feed that breakfast to that Vran, and he's going to get really big and also going to get a lot of tempo from that Harpy synergy. Yeah, absolutely. You end up with one pretty dense Vran, but the Slizzard is just such an important bit of toolkit that was added to Monsters recently. Really opened up a lot of consume-based gameplay for them because of its just absolute flexibility and even being used in Wild Hunt variants for extra riders and stuff. So Slizzard, such an MVP card for Monsters right now. Yeah, the thinning is fantastic, but not in the, obviously in consume, it not only thins, also adds that extra consume tick as well. So it really helps out. And I think it, it's gonna make a big difference here in, the, in the how big the Neckers grow. Do we see the immediate muzzle? We might see it from Genking if he, if he thinks that there are no more Neckers left in Life Coach's hand. Of course, Life Coach has prepared for just the situation. He makes Game King's cards a six point gold. Not fantastic. And he obviously has the, the answers to, to bring out more. Here neck. it comes. It's a six point muzzle, boys. Let's go. And that other Necker is just going to drop on the board to answer it. And Game King's face is going to sink. Although, of course, we also have the option from Life Coach if he wants to, to, to play Gilles and try and find his own muzzle to take back that Necker. Maybe he doesn't <laughs> like uh, this, you know, kind of thieving Property personality theft. from Game King. <laughs> he wants his Necker back. Uh, maybe it's more of a revenge thing, but of course, you can just play one from hand and be kind of in the same situation, but a few points behind. Definitely. I think that that would be a pretty vengeful use of Gilles <laughs> just to get back a three point Necker. But more importantly, that Necker Warrior chain is open to him, which is the absolute core of this deck. And there we go. Necker number two comes down. Game King's eyebrows go up. He knows the muzzle was in vain. And all of a sudden, it's thinking hat time for Game King. And now he has to really focus on stopping, either stopping this, this Necker train, that's one option, or out-tempoing it to the point where you go so high in tempo in the early round ones that because Life Coach's deck uh, plays so progressively and starts amounting Tameria points so slowly at the very start because you're playing seven strength Necker Warriors, three strength Neckers, not big plays at all. But if you start playing John Natalis into, into Blue Stripe Scouts, into Reaver Scout, I mean, you can start getting a lot of points very quickly, especially with Commander's Horn in your hand. So Bloody if he out-tempos quickly, you can really put Life Coach in a tough situation. Yeah, he certainly can. And that is one thing that Foltest is extraordinarily strong at. He is fantastic at just smashing out that tempo, which is really great. And he's already got a double crew in pocket there between Ronvid and the Blue Stripe Scout as well. The good thing for Game King about Life Coach's deck, the Greedy Consume, is it is nigh upon entirely proactive. You know, yeah, okay, you can maybe, you know, get a get a Trebuchet, no, sorry, get a Drowner or something out if you want, but it's not going to keep up with, like, the Blue Stripe Scouts, the Trebuchets. Game King has the tempo here, but Life Coach just has that insane level of carryover that you can get. 
And we see Gangking respecting the Neckers, choosing to play a trebuchet early in that double pocket, like you said, of Crewman. And he wastes essentially six points there because he's not hitting anything to the sides of that Necker. But he also gets a Necker that, if he doesn't get out now, it might be a 10 or a 12 or a 14 point Necker in round three. So he starts cycling those Neckers early. There's only two left in life, which is deck now, even though he already used a Necker Warrior. So, I mean, slowly he can he can kind of, you know, get really into that and try and uh, get those Neckers out as soon as possible. They're still, you know, baby Neckers, just three strength Neckers. Absolutely. By the way, we apologize for the slight robot voice you may be hearing every now and again. Apparently the issue's actually been found, but it'll be fixed by tomorrow. We can fix it live. However, you're right. He is respecting the Neckers, and we saw this used a great uh, effect in Gwen Slam too, just killing them over and over again. And the pass comes in from Life Coach immediately. So interesting. Maybe he just does not want to deal with those crewmen. And of course, we still see the Necker um, at. He's, I mean, first of all, he's messing up Game King's draws where he hasn't really thinned his, his commandos out yet. But of course, we see Game King drawing perfectly, so forget I said anything. And he still has a little bit more carryover than, than Game King as well, so he can't really get the dry pass from Game King here as well. And Game King is not playing Thaler in his deck. Absolutely. And we see a Harvey come out, the famous Monsters Mulligan, but a Kairon he will be very happy with, however. So, Kairon, a great, great card here. Can do target removal and obviously synergizes very nicely with all of the Neckers in your deck. So, yeah, pretty interesting options for both players here. We're seeing a very traditional Trebuchet Fall Test go up against a consume that's actually for once not drawing horribly. And Margarita, great draw as well for Game King. He can lock that Necker and kind of, you know, at least get rid of one Necker from, from joining the party, but Slizzard can just draw more uh, from the graveyard, so not a, not a great solution, really. Yeah, Slizzard really finding so many ways around, so many answers to this card. Really fantastic card, as we previously mentioned. And I'm wondering if we just see sort of more effort go into just getting more Neckers in the deck before we see the Consume Train. Although we see, of course, we don't see any more Necker Warriors in his hand right now, in Life Witch's hand. And he can get the Necker Warrior from the graveyard, but then he can't really get the Neckers if that Necker is locked and he can't cycle it in time. So there's only one Necker left in deck right now because of that round switch and that, that fourth Necker coming out. So Life Witch is in a bit of a pickle. Not, not the worst situation in the world, but he has to really think out his plays here. Yeah, and it's interesting because now there's a double crewman between Ronvid and the Blue Stripe Scout. That means that Trebuchet can kill that Necker and get what I believe would be the last remaining one out of the deck. So, yeah, Life Kitch is actually on a very thin line here where he's got to be very careful with how he moves forward. And that last Necker can get copied, but if you can't have another Necker to be played on board, you can't draw, draw one in round three, then your Neckers are, are gone forever. They're in the bottom of your deck, the, the very depths of the abyss of your deck even, um, and they're not going to find any value there. But of course, um, Life goes with a K-Ren, bumping up that Necker to 4 strength and saving it from that trebuchet. Yeah, I really love that. Not only does he bump up the Necker to 4 strength, he also denies the Crewman Pocket, which is a source of so much damage when those trebuchets are in play. Of course, Game King is going to focus on immediately restoring that with an additional Blue Strike Scout. Really beautiful draws for Game King this round. Well, I mean, the Reaver Scout uh, might be in trouble because there, I think there isn't a target right now. Uh, no, we see uh, two trebuchets in hand, one played in round one, and of course, all, all the Blue Stripe Scouts and Commandos out of his deck. So. At the moment, no target. It could find one later on. Um, of course, we do have uh, Siege Towers from, from uh, Volta in this Volta deck as well from Ganking, so he still has his options, but that Reaver Scout may be a bit out of place right now. Yeah, absolutely. He's finding himself potentially dropping a card down again, which is really not a situation he wants to be in, but it'll be interesting how he handles this. Realistically, how long do you want to play this round against Consume Monsters? That's a scary thing. If you play it too long, your opponent just gets all his carryover ready to go, and you're, you're facing a ton of carryover for round three, sometimes upwards of, of 30 to 40 points in some situations. So it gets really sticky really quickly. If you go for a short round, you're giving the Vrans and the Harpies and all these you know long round effects a ton of points, whereas Volta doesn't really have that long round effect, only the, the crewman pockets and the trebuchets really. Beautiful Harpy shot. While it doesn't get its one tempo, what it does do is disrupt that crewman pocket that we keep talking about, of course. Crewman adds additional damage to trebuchets when they fire, and if there's two next to each other, then it acts as a double boost. So the fact that Ronvid was forced to jump back to defend Maid Bilberry on the siege road is actually a really nice boost to life coach. Though. And life coach committing a Vran here. Vrans might not seem like much at the very start. They're you know six strength units to consume. You know doesn't seem like like all that you know scary of a unit, but the fact that it adds a point to every single necker in your deck. You don't notice, but once these Neckers start coming out, they're at 15, 16, 17 strength. You say, what went wrong? Like, when did this happen? And it's this Vran working in the, in the shadows in the background and really doing his job quite well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Vrans are really the engine unit. We love saying engine unit, but they truly are one of the engine units of the monster faction right now. So it'll be interesting when he chooses to commit. Oh, Neko Warrior. Perfect. So that's the lizard play I really, really like. I like that he's just committing to getting more Neckers in the deck, recognizing, yep, that is my win condition. Better make sure this keeps going. And it's important to do this now and not later on in the round because every consume tick um, that these, these last Press Neckers that are added funny. aren't available for, then obviously they're not going to be boosted as well. They don't. It's not a retroactive boost. It's only once they're in the deck. So the earlier you do that, the earlier all these Neckers are getting boosted and not just one or two. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you want to do that before you slam that second brand down, even before the first brand's done too much, and definitely before that Unseen Elder comes out because you want that triple boost to every Necker in your deck. So pretty good hands for both players. If you have to give an edge to one player's hand right now, is there one that you pick? I think Life Coach is approaching the point where he really gets on a roll here. Yeah, I think it's important to know as well, Life Coach, playing a... a, a greedy consume version that doesn't have three Necker Warriors, it only has two. So a bit safer, a bit, you know, not as greedy, maybe a bit uh, of a safer choice there, but only having two Necker Warriors limits the amount of Neckers you have in your, in your deck, but it also says, you know, I'm not going to force this too much. I'm not going to have, you know, these seven point bronze plays that, you know, invest into a, a, to a carryover for later, but don't do too do much to me uh, right now in, in terms of burst tempo. So I think it's important that Life Coach made the decision because it's really important because not much people are doing that really. Definitely. And there we go. We see the Vran being fred its eggs, like you said, for breakfast. So those are going to start adding significant tempo to the board when they start getting eaten, which is really, really important for Life Coach here as he tries to maintain that point gap as much as possible to let him sort of actually ironically dictate the flow of the round despite the fact Game King won round one. So this is getting into a relatively scary place for Game King now, I think. Yeah, and now we know Life Coach has uh, played two Necker Warriors already. He's maximized the amount of Neckers he's going to have in this game. And now he decides to maybe play Unseen Elder as well, get his Harpies out and also uh, get those Harpy eggs, maybe helping the Vran out so it doesn't get too big. And Margarita coming out instantly, locking that Necker, but we see Shadow in Life Coach's yeah. hand. He has the answers. Shadow is such a fantastic card. I love seeing it played these days because when that card was added to the game, everybody went, yeah, this card is probably going to be good when stuff is added that makes it good. Well, we are certainly at that day now because as you see it getting played in Challenger right now, here comes the Necker. Then we see the big brother at seven strength, the little babies only at four strength, but they're going to get bigger and bigger as this game goes on. And Unseen Elder not going to get its maximum potential and really start, you know, maybe eating the eggs, maybe eating the harpies as well, thinning his deck because he still has two harpies in his deck as well. Yeah, we can see some nice anti egg play should Game King choose to here. That looks like what he's going to go for. He's just going to pop those eggs, deny them the bonus strength, and also get the harpies out of the way of that Vran so he can't eat them. But it is not enough as those harpies keep coming out and denying Ron Vid even the fault test boost poor guy is just he just does not get off does he and what again a horrible day we have flashbacks game king is two cards down round two no spy and and still he's, he's at the same amount of points he's not even really far ahead so life coach going to generate more carryover going to take it kind of slow i think um get his harpies out for sure try and thin his deck out and maybe keep you know his manticore his gills to get those strong plays for round three um he's gonna have carryover and card advantage i mean what more could you want yeah, so we're talking a lot about Life Coach's game plan here because, of course, it is the uh, very sort of attention grabbing side of the board right now, setting up this engine. But if you're Game King, what are you planning to do right now? You're planning to, I mean, you have Shawnee, you're definitely planning to draw Dijkstra. Dijkstra is the finisher <laughs> for Northern Realms. It's the only really um, super high tempo card that you can use that can really maximize his chances. Of course, we don't see Igni in this deck. He likes Igni a lot, but not so much in Fulta. doesn't really have a, a, a slot, I think, in this deck. Um, so I think his real chances is Dijkstra here. But uh, even then, I guess Horn as well, you can save it for round three. And of course, the infantrymen, we haven't seen them yet. It's a 21 strength play. So Game King goes down into round three one card down that is gonna be rough against this consumer lineup but like you say there are infantry abound if deekstra pulls those out that's you know, happy days there's deekstra there's horn game king has a lot of really high power cards remaining so i would say it is far from over yet but life coach has managed to set his necker train up but it's only dropping into six and of course, uh, Game King has to mulligan here. He has to draw. Um, Deekstra has to try and draw him because that's really going to be his win condition. You know, the Reaver Scout would be dead, and he draws. He doesn't draw the Deekstra. A card down, and, you know, sub optimal cards in hand. Cards you don't want to see as finishers in round three. So I think it's tough for Game King right now. Yeah, I think it's very tough for Game King, too. I mean,. What can he do? The Siege Towers are nice for numbers, you know, he can set up a crewman for those. He's got Ron Vid, he can make a crewman pocket with Shani. He can get one of those double boosted, the other one single boosted. He can horn after that. Uh, you know, he can... Well, okay, he can get five targets for Horn. He's missing out key pieces in his deck, though. I mean, yeah. he's been really unlucky with the draws. Nine cards left in the deck. He has Infantryman, Stennis, yeah. 
Deekstra all in his deck. Cards that you want as finishers, cards that really add that burst tempo and give you a, a huge edge against other decks. I mean, when you really get into fights, like tempo fights, round three with Northern Realms, let's be frank, it's it's DJ and the gang, right? Like, you need Deekstra out. He is a phenomenal finisher card, arguably one of, if not the best single card finisher in the game when used correctly in a deck. And when you don't get that and you're against such an engine as this, it's going to be rough. Margarita Res will be decent, but it, will it be enough? I mean, it's, uh, being a card down and having cards that maybe aren't as ideal, Life Witch's Hand on the other hand, it's decent. It's not, you know, it's not a Deekstra. It's not, you know, cards that, that you know get generated a ton of value, but Monster Nest is really good. Mandacore is, you know, decent 13 points. Well, if the Gels hits into the Toad Prince, that's... Especially that's if he scary. finds Toad Prince, then it's a lot more. And it not only, you know, increases the value from the Gels and the Toad Prince, but also from the Monster Nest. And I believe, judging by what I've got on the deck list here, the only options he can get from Gels are a Buyer or Toad Prince. So he's got a 50-50 for the Toad Prince, unless I'm mistaken. And he has the, the Caretaker in terms of gold as well. Yes, he does. So that is... A, he may even choose to Caretaker the Margarita just to deny it from Game King, well, which would be savage. You deny it from Game King, and you'll also Naivety block that Siege Tower, so it really isn't that bad at all. We see the Muzzle instead. Oh, neither of the cards I'm talking yeah. about. That's actually a horrible That's draw. That's terrible, so... Maybe the, the tides have turned. I mean, this is really the worst that the Life Witch could have got in here. That is the double 50 50 losing there, and that is really savage for Life Coach. I mean, he's still in an okay position, but no Toad Prince and no Caretaker is really rough indeed. I think he knew he, he had the chance to play Caretaker there and, and, and deny that Shawnee, and he went for it, but. Again, we were saying game can got unlucky. Now Life Coach is getting unlucky. Not the greatest draws, like you said. He's going to muzzle the Ronvid to deny the Corn target and deny the Crewman. He might He's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. The one value muzzle, yes. The two value muzzle. Two muzzle, of course. Quick two value. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to discredit Ronvid. <laughs> that is phenomenal. Seeing Ronvid get muzzled. I don't know why, but that is so satisfying. <laughs> so we saw Game King going with the six value muzzle. He thought he had the record there, <laughs> but Life Coach says, no, no, no. I'm gonna beat you in this in this series of Gwent and also in the muzzle matchup. He gets the two point Ronvid mulligan there, or the two point Ronvid uh, muzzle there in the end, and now we want to see from a gold card. Yeah, these boys really redefining the uh, the commonly used phrase muzzle meta right now. <laughs> oh man, I just love that Ronvid muzzle so much. But honestly, in terms of crewman and in terms of Horn Deny, it's not even too bad. Like, it it did value, which is what all you can ask of any card, right? Yeah, in the end, it will add up to maybe about, um, I believe, seven points of value because of the Horn and the... Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So it's not too bad. I mean, it ends up being, you know, a, a nine point muzzle so it's not the worst thing in the world it's still pretty bad for a gold card though i know i think it's eight points of value actually two from the muzzle four from the horn two from the boost that Boom. is true That's eight true. point muzzle boom let's go boomba with that muzzle so this is still looking actually remarkably closer than it should have been margarita being forced right now you, ha you obviously can't horn before the margarita um and the shawnee so margarita will probably come out here i don't expect anything else really i think it's still a pretty decent lock on the, on the brand not only because it, it obviously resets it but also locks it and doesn't give more points to the necker as well yes, or it might be a necker lock uh, depending okay. on how many neckers are left in the deck but i believe it's only it might not be any neckers left at all so uh, we're gonna see the lock on the brand instead Okay, so that Commander's Horn is currently representing 16 points of value, which means that Life Coach needs 21 points, but he's got the Elder, he's got the Monster's Nest. I think it might just be enough. Uh, it's gonna have to depend on if the, I believe there aren't any Neckers left in the deck. We will find out now. There definitely are not. There are not. That. If Life Coach doesn't eat it, there's not. <laughs> you see Ron Bit there obviously being eaten, but coming right back up. And Monster Nest only needs to be worth no, it's very little points, just 12 uh, points if you got it. It's that ghoulie boy coming out and he's going to eat the mana core. And there we go, that's going to be Life Coach taking the second game of the series and going 2-0 up in a rivetingly far closer than that matchup potentially looks at the beginning. Consume versus Fall Test fight. I think Life Coach had all the answers when he needed them. He had the extra Neckers, he had the Shadow, you know, helping him out, making sure he draws all the Neckers he needs in this matchup. And of course, Game King, you don't draw Stannis, you don't draw Deekstra, you don't draw Infantrymen. You are in a ton of trouble. And yeah. maybe he, he lost because of skill in the first matchup, because of luck in the second. You know, what's what's left for game three? What's going to happen? Environmental hazard? I'm not it sure. It might be that. What if else can you lose from, really? Like, it's pretty cold here. You know, it could maybe like a blizzard or something. But yeah, that is really bad luck for Game King there. He's going to be kicking himself. I mean, <laughs> just like no Temerian infantry. How do you manage that? When I play, I draw all three round one. Like, get good, Game King. And we see Life Coach very pumped. They're very hype, ready for the next game. I mean, 2 0 up. Big challenger event, you're happy, you're, you're, I mean, you're hyped for the next game. You just one more game and you're in. But of course, 
The reverse sweep, we saw like we saw Game King talking about it. He goes 2-0 up, he gets very confident, he thinks he's in the semifinal already, he starts thinking about that, and then all of a sudden you're reverse sweep and you're going home. Yeah, so, so maybe if he goes 2-0 down, he focuses on the current game maybe and then wins. He's countering so, his own mental yeah. uh, meta, so it might be, you know... He's his own anti-meta. He's 10,000 IQ plays from Game King, yeah. dropping two games to then reverse sweep and dodge his own, you know, mental, uh, you know, problems. So maybe that might be it, but... One more game for the life coach. It's going to be so, so close. If he gets that, I mean, he is on blue coin at least, so Game King has that upper edge at least. He will be going second in this matchup, so he has that chance to maybe try and fix his red coin uh, gameplay in this match. But it's tough. I mean, it's really tough. Having to win three games in a row against the life coach, against the defending champion, it's going to be really hard. Yeah, it's really rough. We may get to cast our first ever double 3 0 in one day, which would be really bad fortune for Game King because that second game was far closer than the, you know, the history records will show. That was a really nail biting game and this series is certainly living up to the hype even with such bad draws game king managed to make it so close that game was his if the dijkstra had come out because that gels was just disastrous and we're going to, going to go into the game very shortly and we have to really note i mean life coach he has to win with the strongest deck in the game i mean amir spies it's, it's really the strongest yeah. deck and he has to win just one game out of three I think he's pretty happy about the deck that he has left, and Game King may be a bit scared as well, because, I mean, going up against a deck that maybe is, is tier two or high tier, you know, low tier one, you think, oh, I have a chance, you know, get some good draws, play pretty well, we can probably do it. But against Spies, a, a deck that's been feared for, for months now, it's going to be tough mentally. Yeah, I mean, you're in Nilfgaard playing in front of Emir for the Sun Ring, and you've got to beat Nilfgaard three times. That's not a position that many players would find enviable. No, it's definitely, it definitely is, and we see right off the bat, um, Game King is bringing Aerodin, a great deck we've mentioned before, with the red coin, you can really play uh, for your set of plays in round one and make sure you can uh, play your Frost out, play your you know, lower tempo plays like the, like the Frost Towns, for example, um, and then uh, you know, get that game, the board state really in your favor, and then start adding in the tempo with the Riders and the Irish, for example. So Game King, I think, is pretty hyped about the red coin in this matchup. Yeah, I think he's obviously, Aerodin is a red coin deck, right? Every player you ask says that. <laughs> it's like, oh, so I guess you're playing Aerodin on the red and they're kind of like, well, I would never play it on the blue one. So, yeah, Uridin is a very conflict dependent deck, but it does perform very, very nicely when you get to play in that reactive fashion. So, will be an interesting match. Uridin can do pretty well against Spies. And we see Van Hemar. I mean, that's the big weather clear. You don't normally see the bronze weather clears in the Nilfgaard deck. It's a deck that's very competitive in its, in its bronze slots, and there is no space for bronze weather clears. Uh, you like to take the Van Hemar. He can, you know, he's decent with overdose, a decent amount of points, but in this matchup, it's definitely going to be the weather clears. Yeah, absolutely. We see Game King pulling off the reverse Petrify. All four golds in hand. That is a huge boon, but it does make Gels rather pointless. Not, not so not much pointless, pointless but, but, but definitely, diminished. definitely if you draw the, the one silver you didn't want, you don't have the option to get the second gold, so it becomes tricky. I mean, we've already seen some bad gills draws in the last game from Life Coach, so maybe the game decides to, to honor that tradition and also find some maybe un, unideal uh, silver draws as well. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's kind of the classic, yeah, I drew all four of my golds and I'm running Renew and Roll Decree. Oh, God, never mind. So it's going to be an interesting opener for Game King because essentially he only really has high power plays in his hand. He's sort of lacking his normal stuff. So Life Coach gets a kind of a free pass, right? Like he can set up and he'll probably get white frosted. I imagine he'll get white frosted. Yeah, I mean, Game King's going to have time. Life Coach, of course, here roping it out. It's something he <laughs> likes to do. He likes to really think about his plays. He might just go for the dry pass, but Ooh. going for the dry pass, you're giving Airden control of the game and Airden in the long round three. I mean, Spies is the one deck that can really generate a ton of points in a long round three because it says, you know, I have these synergies that work very well together. If you don't stop them, I'm going to generate 200 points in a round. But Aerodin, I mean, three Frost, you have one clear only. If Game King plays his, his Frost right and he can really, you know, play his weather correctly, going into a long round, it's going to be really tricky. Yeah, you're definitely right on that. Aerodin being able to control the length of the rounds he plays is just absolutely ideal for him. So I imagine we'll see a very short round two from Game King because he wants that Frost to deal this damage. But the problem is, if he spends all of his Frost and then Vanamar happens, you've got the bounce for Vanamar too, right? You've got Emir sitting there. So that could get really problematic for Game King. It's going to be interesting here. We're going to see maybe a Rider coming from Game King's hand, or maybe just a Slizzard decides to drop that. Instead, it goes for the Rider. It opens up the chance for the Slizzard to be a 12-point play with the Rider coming out as well, and it also thins his deck out later on. So I think with what he had in hand, it was the best uh, solution there. Oh, I think it was 100% the correct play. Riders coming out of Slizzard is really nice, but that Frost Draw is not. And we don't see any Frost Hounds yet, something you want to play those Frost from. So There's a Frost Hound. Finally, they come, out, they come out to play. We'll see if they play in this turn or just in one long abomination of a round three with, you know, just frosty lanes all around. 
Absolutely, that's what we like to see. Cracking open a few cold ones with the boys all over the lanes. And that is Game King's plan for this. We'll see a relatively short round two, because I imagine he just wants that frost to destroy Nilfgaard. And again, Life Coach, Mulligan, he's roping even the Mulligans, making sure he has <laughs> the maximum amount of time to think about his plays and his game plans and how to approach this very tricky matchup. I mean, Game King, if he wants to pass now, he might get draw badly in round three, and maybe a, a Vanny Mark, like you said, could really decide the game a bit. And a long round against Spies, even if you're Aerodin, is always scary. They generate a lot of points very quickly out of nowhere. So maybe he decides to go for, you know, a mid range round three, gets rid of some of the engine units like the Enforcers and like the Impair Brigades, and then go for, you know, a seven to eight card round, round three, maybe. Yeah, I think you're right on that. I think you fundamentally have to go mid range, because if you go, you lose the short. You get Joaquimed in the short, right? So you've got to go mid range because the long those Imperial forces, if they're not dealt with efficiently, which to be fair, you know, he's got a fair, fair few cases of drowners in his hands. He could deal with the enforcers, but you're right. Like, it's when you start looking at the individual cards that are played in Nilfgaard and you start seeing things like, oh yeah, there's an Iris. Oh yeah, there's the Vanimar. Oh yeah, there's Menno. There's so many huge point engines in that deck that a long round can just be crazy to play against. And Game King, again, if Van Hemar isn't used right now, if it's used right now, Game King can just pass and say, I don't care if I'm a card down, I'm going to weather Patience all your rows next time you're, you're in trouble. Well, of course, we can use it with, with Emir as well and just bounce it like we saw with Peter before, before, so that's always going to be an option as well. So here we go. We see the White Frost cleared up. Vanamar's going to come back to the hand. That, of course, being Emir's leader ability, playing a card, then returning one to your hand. And that is going to mean that Game King knows Vanamar's in the hand, which is an important bit of information. And that's why Frost already dealt with. Uh, can't be played again, of course. Nothing to, to res weather cards just yet. Um, and of course, we see a spy in, in Lycos' hand. We see him obviously being a card up because of the dry pass in round one. And we don't quite see Frightener just yet in Game King's hand. So maybe it's going to be an issue of card advantage once again. Potentially, yes. I think that Game King is going to struggle to spend things that he doesn't want for round three. Because if you look at his hand, he's got a Manticore he can drop. Maybe that'll open up a little bit of a point gap, but... Realistically, you look at his hand and he, he wants this stuff for round three. And we don't see Iris and we don't see Frightener either. Two cards that you really might need in this round uh, for Game King. And of course, we have the one very interesting interaction. Life Coach does have Iris in his hand. If it were to go on Game King's board and then die, Game King could use his Lizard to draw out that Iris from his own deck. So very tricky, subtle, uh, uh, little intricate detail uh, in Gwenther that might come in handy for Game King if he, if he knows about it. Yeah, that's certainly true and a really nice detail to point out. We've actually seen that be very controversial in Gwen's line when it was actually missed in some games. But uh, yeah, it would be really cool to see that iris Slizzard interaction in play. That's something that we've been kind of hoping to see in tournaments. But we see the Imperial forces come down just start to make their presence known on the board. And they're playing right into the Frost just to dodge that Drowner damage as well, which of course would not only um, damage them from the Drowner movement, but also hit them under the Emir and kill them instantly, basically, which is not a good thing for Enforcers. No, it's certainly not. Drowner, one of the key, key cards against Enforcers. But yes, I sort of counterintuitively, the way to counter it is just dropping them straight in the weather, like you mentioned. At least you counter the Drowner, so you have that going for you at least. Gaming here just going to set up that Rider and set up that extra bit of damage um, for the rest of the turn. Or maybe he's going to, you know, shut me up and play something different. Instead, he decides to bamboozle me and then go ahead and play the Rider. Um, and just make sure he gets the maximum tempo right from the start on that Frost. Yeah, there we go. That's that Frost going to be taking three damage a turn, except when it's going to hit two damage ammo. Of course, it will deal two damage. But yeah, that's going to mean that over a long round, that Frost just does such savage damage because he knows that while Life Coach has Vanamar in hand, he is not going to want to spend that because he knows that if he does, round three is going to be painful. Like you said, there's some very awkward cards right now. I mean, Slizzard would need to have find maybe a Frost Hunt if that Frost Hunt is pinged down by an Enforcer, for example, to try and draw that out and get some extra Frost. But then Venimar can just be played and just clear it all out and also, you know, heal other humans as well. So it's, it's tricky, really. Yeah, and here we see just an Emissary coming out from Rain Fat, of course, because Joachim and Cantarella are both in the hand of Life Coach. And another Enforcer comes down, just establishing that presence on the board. And Life is now deciding which row he wants to play on. Maybe he's going to stack the back row, although he might be scared of maybe a potential last rate from Game King. So he thought about it there, but decides in the end to just stack that back row and keep those Enforcers alive for as long as possible. Yeah, and that Emissary being executed with the final crossbow bolt 
does mean that Vic of Our Medic is able to resurrect it, and Life Coach can keep his Spy Train moving without spending the other emissary in his hand. Yeah, the Spy Train, I mean, no stops at all. It's going to go full force, <laughs> and the Vic of Our Medic and the emissaries really help to do that. Thin out your deck, get the Spy Synergy, the points on the Enforcers and the Imperial Brigades, and really end up in a short round three with a very thin deck and pretty much, you know, the exact same finisher every single game. Joachim into a big unit, into Menno, uh, and you end up winning, you know, a lot of games. That's why Spies is really tier one. Yeah, it's an absolute, like, sort of, you know, nigh upon a 0% fail rate deck, right? You know how your taxes is going to go each game. So this is one of the strengths of the deck, and it's one of the weaknesses of the Origin deck, because like we saw, Game King narrowly avoided not drawing any hounds. That would have been disastrous. A disastrous draw two games in a row for Game King. We see Game King playing on his hounds and, you know, setting up these frosts, but that might just decide, uh, give Life of the chance to play the Van Hemar and, and clear that frost out. Of, the, of course, though, it'll give Game King the chance to maybe go into round three with a few frosts left and uh, no Van Hemar in sight. No words mean nothing yeah, so here now. comes Vanamar. He's gonna Cliss, guys. So there we go. That is Vanamar out of contention for, like, round three, which is a pretty interesting development in this game because it means that cards like Slizzard can be used to play more frosts onto the board and Karen Thier as well, allowing at least two rows to be frosted from what I can see. But it also means that Life Coach will have to... He's a card up right now, unless he can get back the card advantage, so... It's troublesome for Game King. If he were to pass now, he would have a long round three, but he's going to be a card down. So I think he's going to go for a long round two, try and really, you know, squeeze out the maximum tempo from, or the maximum value from the Igni from his Frost, now that he knows that there is no clear left. Yeah, definitely. He's going <laughs> to really try to breathe life coach for everything that he's worth, which is going to be rough because he needs to Frost in a row that opens up Drowner play on those Enforcers. Yeah, and we see, obviously, this Lizard not ideal right now. He needs more Frost in this round. He knows there's no clear. He knows he can go all out with, you know, these frosty effects, and he knows that with only one Frost, it might not be enough to really get enough value over a long round. Yeah, so the, the Weather Row is now open, so the Drowner counter has sort of been negated a little bit. That does open up a lot of tempo options for Game King, but it just doesn't compare to the tempo play of Northgard. And we have to look at the Caretaker targets as well, if you want to use Caretaker in this turn. I mean, not drawing Iris is huge. If he finds it with Gilles, uh, it can be massive, but of course there's uh, there's no Frost in the back row, and the Rider right now is, is dead in the back row as well, so we have to find another Rider as well, which can be done with Slizzard, so there are chances, and once that Iris goes off, Infiltrators and Menno are going to deal with at least one big unit, but oh no! We see the chance for Slizzard to be to be played with Iris. Iris. The Slizzard Iris potential. Will Game King see it? If any player does, his love for Iris is known above all others. So I certainly hope he does. But speaking of Caretaker, there is actually currently nothing in game, in Life Coach's graveyard. So it'll be anything he kills will be the Caretaker target. But he sees the Iris there. Will he go for it, though? That is the question. And there's an enormous point cap as well. If Game King doesn't pass here and he plays low tempo, it can't really can be played even, because you have the Enforcers on the board as well to get that extra tempo. And I, I love the Irish from, from Life Coach. It buffs up the Enforcers. It, it makes it so they don't die instantly to Drowners into the Frost. And it, 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 it says, you know, I'm going to use one of my win conditions, maybe, um, in this round where I can guarantee the value and push you out of it. Uh, you don't have Frightener. You don't seem to have Frightener. And we're going to go into a long round three. Yeah, here's a reasonable Igni from Game King that he's considering. It's going to be a 16-point Igni, and also it removes an Enforcer, so really the actual value of that Igni. The longer round is much, much higher because it denies the damage that they deal. So, decent Igni all round from Game King. I think it definitely guarantees that Game King is staying in this round for a long time. If you use um, Igni, which is almost a win condition against uh, Spies, you kind of know there's going to be a big unit with Joachim, for example. You know that if you go into a, into a short round three, or you know a moderately short round three, you can, you can move around the rows with the Drowners and almost guarantee a great Igni. Using it round two means, you know, I'm going to go full force in this round and really try and bleed you out. Yeah, that's definitely what he's got to do because he knows. The problem is, I can't help but feel like with only six cards in hand, he's very quickly approaching the stage where Nilfgaard is just going to roll over him in a much shorter round. Black. Exactly. I mean, he doesn't have a rider. He doesn't have a caretaker target. He's going to depend a lot on what he draws with gills. He can, of course, get a slizzard from from the... Uh, he can get an Irish from the slizzard, but there's no rider to instantly kill it. So, it, can that be played around? I mean, it, it's it's tough. Yeah, I mean, he may be fishing for his Toad Prince again with Gills, probably only to be greeted by a buyer, knowing his luck so far, but the Toad Prince would be nice, but really, he's getting to the very, very dangerous area. And the Caretaker can always draw uh, maybe an Enforcer. It can, it can take that from Lightfoot's Graveyard, and that'll help with the Iris, uh, the instant proc, the damage, and then the Frost killing it instantly, so there is that option as well, and he's, he's looking to the Graveyard now, looking at his targets and deciding if that's, you know, actually the right play to make right now. Yeah, definitely. It looks like he's going to go for the Slizzard, so this is going to come down for the iris. There it is. And that is going to go... Is he going to go... Yeah, he's just going to let that tick away in the frost. It's interesting. Do you he's think... He's considering the drowner for the instant kill, but 
I am sadness. Uh, Sisking Frost is the same, essentially. He's got a way to turn regardless. And he knows that he has, he has an Enforcer for the Great Caretaker, but obviously not the most fantastic target, I think. You definitely want something at least, you know, silver or, you know, a really situational bronze that can get yeah, you a ton of ton of value. I but cost in this case, my oh, and we see the buff on the Irish, which is huge nice. from, the from, the, from the ambassador. It's, it's massive. Oh my goodness. You can't see us right now, but if you could, you would see how much we just winced when that came out. That is a horrible play for Ganking to be faced with and a pretty awesome play for Life Coach to pull off. And that is just so rough for him. The Igni has been wasted. There's no real easy way to kill a 13 point unit on Life Coach's, Life Coach's side. If you would have seen the Caretaker come out, once that Enforcer is out on your board and that Iris comes down, you can ping it instantly and kill it in that round. But because he, he played a bit riskier and decided not to, not to use the Caretaker, now he's greeted with a 13 point Iris. I mean, I don't think she's sadness anymore. She is not sadness. She is strength, if anything. But uh, this is getting to really Let precarious ground for Game King. Here comes the girls. There's the Toad Prince. Okay, he's going to be pretty happy with that. That's a 19-point Toad Prince, essentially, because of the girls. So that's going to eat the man's core away. Get an extra Drowner into his hand. All in all, not a bad Toad Prince. But if that Iris doesn't die, you essentially played for very low... I mean, zero tempo, right? With, with this three. Lizard. <laughs> like... Well, you have this Lizard at least, so it bounces out. But <laughs> it really isn't it. ideal at all. <laughs> Absolutely, that is not ideal whatsoever. And he's just got no way to access that Iris. That Iris is not going anywhere, but the Nalzica Brigade will certainly be cracking some skulls. And we see Cantarella as well from Life Witch's side. I mean, he's going to have a stronger finish, I think, uh, for sure, with with the Joachim, for example. Um, Caretaker going to be a decent finisher, but I don't think he's going to find... I mean, he has Kalec, for example, but that's really, really it in a, in a short round. Yeah, absolutely. There's the Nalzica Brigade executing the Ambassador, and of course, Imperial Forcer takes a shot at... What's it going to be? It's going to be the Rider? He's trying to bamboozle us again. This time, this time it's Life Coach deciding to, to, you know, play around with us a bit. But oh, yeah. goes for the <laughs> goes for the emissary instead, and he's still, you know, a card up, a lot of points up. I mean, Life Coach is in a very good position, and he has his finisher still intact. He has Meno, he has Infiltrator, he has that Vigavara medic, and he has uh, maybe Teresa emissary that he just killed, and he has Cantarella, which isn't great, but he can play it out now if he wants if he finds you know the correct gap. Yeah, definitely. I think that Game King is getting in a rougher and rougher position. This is just ignoring the like whole Joaquin Menno sitting in Life Coach's hand. Game King is not looking fantastic right now. With that Irish dead, the game would be completely different, but because that Ambassador player was able to buff it up, and there is no real way for Game King to kill it in his hand. He has a lot of genres, you can kind of juggle it around, but it'd be pretty tedious. Maybe he's going to go for just that. There we go, we see the Nausicaa getting hauled into the frost to take some damage. But at this point, it's just a bleed play. It doesn't make a significant difference to the round. Yeah, he's trading bronze cards for maybe higher value cards from Life Coach. But even then, I mean, uh, your finisher is a monster knife, which is going to be decent on a Manticore. It's a 20 point uh, card. But without card advantage with Menno and Infiltrator in the background sneaking around, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Even if you get a, a huge unit, I mean, it, it's going to be very, very vulnerable. I mean, that Igni is just sitting on Game King Cedro, taunting him that he didn't burn the Iris. It's a, a really, really rough play. Jeez, so we're going to see most likely just a Enforcer come out, right? Or, I mean, if you want to think, the it doesn't matter too much. The Infiltrator right. can open up that Meno in this turn if he needs yeah, it. Um, that's true. And also just uh, maybe save. I mean, Enforcer round three isn't great to pull with your. Yeah, he could Meno the Toad just sort of preemptively in case he does need it. Or you can thin your deck out if you think you're in a very comfortable position, which he kind of is in, maybe. Um, he wants to get the Enforcer to thin it out and have a better if Infiltrator drawn round three, but instead he does stealth. go for the Infiltrator, which kind of puts a lot of, a lot of pressure on getting He plays a little bit safer, I think. That's like an intense safety play. I mean, <laughs> having an 18-point unit be marked as disloyal opens up 26-point meno, which is just not something that Game King can contest with. So I would expect to see this round come to a close fairly quickly, but I think Game King's gone past the point in no return. I think he's played this round way too far. Yeah, with an Iris on your board, you're still, you know, a bit scared, a bit skeptical. Um, it, it is a thirsting strength, so it's not it's not maybe going to get killed very easily, but if it is killed, you want to make sure you have the chances to catch back up in tempo with the Menno, with the Giant Toad, for example, so, or the Toad Prince, uh, with its <laughs> new new acquired title, so uh, I think Life Coach played very safely here. He definitely wants to make sure he can uh, clear out this game in a, in a correct and, and consistent and safe manner and not really risk it. Being 2-0 up, he wants to make sure he has the best chance to win this game. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason. Well, we, even game King highlights it as his weakness, right? He's like, yeah, when I'm 2-0 up, I kind of, you know, start thinking I'm already in the semi-final. Life coach definitely not falling victim to that, taking every card very, very seriously indeed, but that is a savage blow. 
and we see Game King maybe maybe thinking about about going for uh, trying to kill that Iris, but is there any way to do it? I mean, the Enforcer does, does two points of damage, it goes goes down to nine, and the Drowner can hit it for another six if it if it gets under the points of the in the five strength Enforcer on the row. But I think it's just not enough. I think it's not enough because I think it would be that Imperial Enforcer would have tanked a hit from the Frost, so it would be on two, so it wouldn't even get hit by the Frost. Sorry, it would be on three, so it wouldn't even get hit by the Frost. I don't think there's a way that he can kill that Iris right now. I think it's, it's really tough for Game King here. He doesn't really have a way out. No, he doesn't. And by looks on his face, he's looking very frustrated. I think he knows that this game is not in a position where he wanted it to be in. And Let it looks like we see Cantarella come out from Life Coach. That, oh, it just fills the forts. My goodness. And this allows uh, Life Coach to maybe save that Menno for round three and just decide to play Vilga Forts here if he needs to play another card here, which he, he definitely does right now. Um, so maybe that's his option. Uh, he decides to save the, the Infiltrator uh, Menno combo for round three. And Game King going all the way here. Going for this monster nest, this Drowner. Potentially going to move the Iris, but I mean, is it enough? It's, 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 it's going to move the rain front of the. I mean, does he, he just. I think at this point move. he's just picking which card he likes the least, to be honest. He's going to move Iris in. She betrayed him in the past, never again. Because I don't think that's going to have effect on this game. And again, the Iris at 7 strength, not even going to get affected by the by the Frost. We see the, the Enforcer obviously at 5 strength, and you get. Um, uh, obviously, the, you're going to get hit before because it is a lower strength unit, so. Game King, uh, a lot of points ahead, but we do see the Menno into a Toad possibility. The Cats right back up and not be one card up, but be two cards up. I mean, it's massive for Life Coach. Yeah, this is a really, really horrendous situation for Game King to be in. I think that, you know, he when you push to this short around against Nilfgaard, it's just so dangerous because they have such powerful one cards. So this is going to be very, very rough. I don't particularly see a way out for Game King here. This has happened in not just one matchup, but in every single round. Game King has gone to a long round two, trying to get by card advantage, but it's just too much. Menno proving why he's in this deck, you know, a fantastic card. And of course, the Nazca Brigade into the okay. Iris. Okay. That is what he wanted to do. That was his option. Not bad, not bad at all. Completely wrong. A huge point swing here. 100% jubated. 100% jubated. The, the, the Cantrell does get buffed, but Menno has been played already, so that does not matter. And now Life Coach. Completely, I mean, game can turn around the match completely. He's with not that. mic'd up right now, but Swim is looking shocked. I will tell you that much. That was an incredible Nausicaa Brigade from Game King right there. Life Coach truly knocked for six. All of us, in fact. I'm sure the you know 800 IQ Twitch chat was yelling about that, but that is an incredible Nausicaa Brigade on the Iris and a great line of sort of forethought in setting that up. He, he set that up from about five turns before. I mean, he yeah. moved that Nausicaa Brigade Please. first to get it to nine strength, and then he, he played into that, uh, uh, the Iris obviously going into seven strength, and just the right amount for the Nausicaa Brigade to kill it and buff itself, and then buff the whole board by 25 points. And I mean, Life Coach now has completely changed the story. I mean, the Frost still ticking. He does have a Vilga Force, which could be enough if he draws correctly, but he might just have to use the Infiltrator as well. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, it's a Nausicaa. It's gonna kill. It's gonna kill the. Uh, just you have the Joaquin kill target Joaquin, there, right? yeah. um, which will be a buff, but it won't be enough with the frosting as well. So he's got we're gonna the go. So we're gonna go top deck v top deck. And there That's are still semi-final places. Very I bad cards left in Game King's deck. He does still have a Frost Town. He does still have a Frost. He has some cards he does not want to see. So we're gonna go into a hundred percent. Let's go. One card v one card. It all comes down to this for a place in the semi-final tomorrow. Face There's the Freddy frost. Babes. There's the frost that's gonna get Mulligan, but hey, at least the frost will be gone. There's and the an emissary, emissary. I mean, two oh cards that aren't ideal. We're gonna see what each what player does. What draws are these? And the frost oh, town. Four so points. Can you beat four points? Emissary, I think, does it as long as there are bronze. I think emissary does, emissary, emissary does it. Emissary does it. I believe. Do it. Okay, he's gonna keep it. He's gonna keep it. He's gonna keep it. Oh my goodness. A shame but that Wadman Hound has a frost. Yeah, it is going to be a six point play in the end. Be eight. The Imperial Brigade is going to be eight. It's going to be a, a tie. Is this going to be a tie? It might no, be. We medic, have to pick up our medic. Medic medic will be better, medic, of course. Yeah. It adds one extra point, and it can the also block the frost. So it's, it's two extra oh, points. Oh, it's a 13 strength Nausicaa Brigade. And a 13 strength yeah. Nausicaa. So. Okay, oh my goodness. That was so close, though. The Imperial Brigade would have been a tie. My heart just lurched when I was like, wait, frost, six points? That's a tie. Then I was like, okay, no, there's a huge Nausicaa Brigade sitting right there. So there we go. Oh my goodness, that is Life Coach taking it 3-0 to secure his place in tomorrow's semi-finals, beating out Game King, but in some very close games. The camera's not, there we go. All righty.